Okay, here we are. What we're talking about today when we get started is um, finding the degrees of polynomials and finding rational polynomials. It's actually all very interesting. Because zeros, zeros generate zeros generate polynomials. So, yeah. rather than the other way around. You'd think it would be the other way around, but it's not. Zeros generate polynomials with the formula. F of X. equals a times x minus c1 times x minus c2 times x minus z3s, where z1 is the first zero, z2 is the second zero, z3 is the third zero. And we're going to use them to generate a polynomial. And here they are. We're going to let negative 1 be z1, negative two, uh, positive 2 be z2, and negative 8 be z3. And we're also going to assume that the number a right there equals 1 because we aren't being told. Actually, we are being told right here. A is the leading coefficient, and if you don't see a number in front of the leading term, then, um, yeah, it's a one, positive one. So then, we're going to have f of x equals Okay, we have three zeros here, so I put three factors. These are factors. Factors of f of x. All right, so we're going to have one. So one times x minus negative one times x minus positive two times x minus negative eight. And then we clean that up because negative negative is plus. This will give us x plus one times x minus two times x plus eight. And when we multiply those three factors, we can generate this polynomial, and notice they're asking about what is the number in front of the x squared. Well, we're going to have to find out. Okay, so I am going to group together these two factors. It doesn't matter which two you start with. Those just look as good as any. So 
So I will have x plus 1 times x squared plus 8x minus 2x minus 16. So we'll have x plus 1 times x squared, 8x minus 2x is plus 6x minus 16. Okay, now I take the x from here and multiply it by the second set of parentheses, x squared plus 6x minus 16. And then I take the plus one. And multiply it by the second set of parentheses. X squared plus 6x minus 16. And so, now I'll distribute the x. I'll distribute the one and I will get x to the third plus 6x squared minus 16x plus x squared plus 6x minus 16. Ah, 7x squared. We have 6x squared plus 1x squared, so that will be 7x squared. Seven x squared minus sixteen x plus six x is minus ten x and minus sixteen. So that's the polynomial generated by the three zeros we were given, negative one, two, and negative eight, assuming A equals one, or just taking it from there, that A is one. Any questions about this? Okay. Now remember, these are all real rational zeros. Okay, um, they're the kind of numbers we like. These, however, if you remember your intermediate algebra at all, these are complex numbers. So the number, the polynomial generated by these zeros is, well, it's going to be generated like this. f of x equals parentheses. Again, we're going to include, uh, we're going to include, we're going to assume that a equals 1 because we aren't being told what it equals. That would go here. So here's going to be the formula. X minus C1 times X minus C2 times X minus C3. Okay, so 
assume A is 1, and we can let uh, Z1 equal 1, and Z2 equal 7i, and Z3 equal negative 7i. So we'll have x minus 1 times x minus 7i times x minus negative 7i. So we'll have x minus 1 times x minus 7i times x plus 7i. And now we're going to multiply these two terms, these two factors together and notice their conjugates. It's very convenient. The x terms match, the 7i's match, but the numbers between them are opposite. That means they are conjugates. Why do we care? This is why we care. When you've got conjugates, You can take the first terms only when you have conjugates. You can take the first terms and multiply them together and get x squared, and then a minus sign, and then the second term, which is 7i. You can multiply those together and that's what you get the x minus 7i and x plus 7i are in the form of a, a minus a minus b times a plus b which gives you a squared plus ab minus ab plus uh, minus b squared. ab minus ab is zero. So this is a squared plus zero ab minus b squared, which is a squared minus b squared. So we can use that here to make our lives considerably easier. Now, remembering back to intermediate algebra, when I square seven I, that will equal, oops, square it, seven squared times I squared. Seven squared is 49. But I squared, that's one of those numbers you had to remember. I squared is negative one. Remembering that I is the square root of negative one from the complex number system. I squared is negative one. I to the third is negative I i to the fourth power is positive one, and i to the zero power is also one. Okay, so that's a refresher. For what we do, this is probably the most important to remember. 
because it happens a lot. So 49 times negative one is negative 49. So we'll come back over here, we'll have x minus one times x squared minus negative 49. which is going to be, oh, x squared, which is going to be x squared plus, because of the minus minus, x squared minus, for, uh, x squared plus 49. Okay. Now I'm just going to multiply these since this is a binomial and this is a binomial, so I'll have x times x squared plus 49 minus one times x squared plus 49. That will give us x to the third plus 49x minus x squared minus 49. And then writing them in order, descending order, we'll have x to the third minus x squared plus 49x minus 49. So, that is how these three zeros generated this polynomial. And while one is a real rational zero. Seven I and negative seven I are called complex conjugate zeros. Okay. Now, before I, I ask for questions, I want to go through all of these. Um, I, that is these, because this these right here are real numbers. They're really in the real number system. They're on the X axis. You just can't get a definite answer for them out of your calculator. So four, let's let Z1 equal four, which is a real rational zero. And then Z2 is seven odd. Ah, uh, uh, no, it's not, not anymore. Is four plus three, four plus the square root of three and Z3 is four minus the square root of three. Notice that these are conjugates, but they're not complex. They are 
real, irrational zeros. Hey, we like to name things in math. All right, this is going to look pretty horrible, but there's a trick to make it easier. So just watch. Um, we're going to continue to assume A is 1 unless we're told differently. All right, A times X minus C1 times X minus C2 times X minus C3. Okay. Now, F of X is 1, we're assuming. So now, X minus Z1 which is 4, x minus z2. Now, look at this. I'm going to change this to a bracket. It's not wrong if you don't, but I'm going to just, because I'm going to have nested parentheses. All right, this is going to be x minus parentheses four plus the square root of three. Notice that that acts like a binomial. It's two terms. So four plus the square root of three times x minus parentheses four minus the square root of three. Now that looks pretty hideous. This is the kind of thing you have to take one step at a time and use the trick we actually used before. You'll see, and it's not anywhere near as hard as it might be if you just attacked it straight on. Okay, if you've got a one multiplying everything, it disappears we'll have x minus 4 bracket. I'm going to distribute the minus sign here and here. So I will have x minus 4 minus the square root of 3 times, we're going to do it again, distribute the minus sign x minus 4. Now minus times minus is plus, or negative times negative is plus. The square root of 3. And so that's where I'm at right now. I have x minus 4 in parentheses times x minus 4 minus the square root of 3 in brackets. I'm leaving the brackets. You'll see why in just a minute. And then times bracket x minus brackets x minus 4 plus the square root of 3. Now here's the trick to make all of this easier. You have two terms here. Uh, well, you have two factors. x minus 4 minus the square root of three. I mean factors of interest, okay? Not, not counting x minus four. And x minus four plus the square root of three. Notice this, that if you put parentheses 
around the x minus 4 and the x minus 4, you're going to have a minus b times a minus b, uh, times a plus b, I'm sorry. a minus b times a plus b, these are conjugates. which means we'll get a squared minus b squared, which means we'll get x minus four squared, because that's what a is, minus b squared, which is the square root of three. That's our next move. x minus 4, bracket, parentheses, x minus 4, minus the square root of 3, times x minus 4, plus the square root of 3, and then that will give us x minus 4 all right this we already worked this out this becomes i still have to keep my brackets though because i have nested parentheses still for a little bit longer So that's what I've got right now. X minus four in parentheses, and in brackets I have X minus four in parentheses squared minus the square root of three squared. Now I'm going to continue working on this. And just leave this guy, let him wait. Just let him wait. Go get an ice cream cone or something while it's still warm enough. All right, now. X minus four squared is X minus four times X minus four. Minus the square root of three squared is just three. Square root of three squared, the square and the square root cancel each other out, leaving you with a three. There. Now the ugly radicals are gone. And because I'm about to multiply that and that, um, I can get rid of my bracket now if I want to. I don't have to. X squared minus 4x minus 4x plus 16 minus 3, which is going to be is it a long problem? Yeah, this is college algebra. X squared minus 8X plus 16 minus 3 is 13. Close parentheses. Now we're going to have, okay, I take the X, bring it straight down, and multiply it by the parentheses. Then I take the minus four,
and put it right here and multiply it by the parentheses. Now I distribute, I distribute, and 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 I distribute. And I distribute. Ugh, what is four times 13? 52, okay. So x times x squared is x to the third. x times minus 8x is minus 8x squared. x times plus 13 is plus 13x. Now, minus 4 times x squared is minus 4x squared. Minus 4 times minus 8x is plus 32 x minus 4 times positive 13 times plus 13 is minus 52. Whew! Now all I have to do is get my like terms together. I have 1x to the third term, x cubed, 1 constant term. And I'll combine the eight up the eight x squared and the minus four x squared. That is minus eight x squared and then minus four x squared is going to be minus twelve x squared. And then thirteen x plus thirty-two x cheat a little bit, put it there. That will be 45 X plus, I mean, you're adding plus and plus. So our polynomial that was generated by one real rational zero and two real irrational zeros that are conjugates ended up giving us a polynomial with real and rational coefficients. Which is one of the really cool things. And again, that's how the zeros of a function generate a polynomial. So let's go back to the beginning. In our first problem, we had real rational zeros. And throughout this, we assumed A is one. We used this um, a formula, and that's what permits the zeros to create the polynomial. F of X equals A times X minus Z1 times X minus Z2 times X minus Z3. Notice if you have three zeros, you get a polynomial of highest degree three. If you have four factors, or four zeros, they make four factors, and they give you um, a polynomial with highest degree four. That's another cool thing about math, algebra in particular. Okay, now, here we have one real rational zero, but we have complex conjugate zeros, a pair of them. And so we have to use this conjugate trick. 
but what we get is a polynomial with real rational coefficients. That would only happen if you had um, a complex number and its conjugate. Same thing is true here for the real irrational numbers. You've got two real irrational numbers that are conjugates of each other and a four, which is real rational. And that's how you end up getting just normal looking uh, real rational coefficients. You've got a one, you've got a negative 12, you've got a plus 45, positive 45, you've got a, a negative 52. They're just normal kinds of numbers. Now, how does that wonderful miracle happen? Here we are. This is the next set of homework. Um, and what you do here is read the problem. Suppose a polynomial function, so we know we're going to have a polynomial, of degree four with rational coefficients has the following given number of zeros. They only give us two. Z1 equals I and Z2, excuse me, equals 10 minus the square root of 11. Now we have to find the other zeros. Well, notice this says with rational coefficients. We're building, a, we want to build a polynomial function of degree four, highest power four, that has rational coefficients. That is, it has real rational coefficients like this. We don't want any I terms in our final answer, and we don't want any radicals in our final answer. We just want normal looking numbers. For that to happen, well, certainly to have degree four, we have to have two more zeros. And there's a rule that makes us come up with it. When we're going to have real rational zeros, uh, uh, coefficients, the numbers in front of the variables, we have to have the conjugate of each one of these terms also be zeros. So the answer to this problem, find the other zeros, and that's all you have to do. You don't have to build the polynomial. Um, you have to come up with the conjugate of this. Okay, if Z1 is I, then Z3, because we have a Z2 there, Z3 is going to be the conjugate of positive I, which is negative I. And if Z2 is a real but irrational zero with two parts like this, we have to come up with its conjugate, 10 plus the square root of 11. So these have to be the other two zeros. So in the answer box, I would say negative I, comma, and 10 plus the square root of 11. Those are the other zeros. That is just so neat. On this one, would the 10 plus the square root of 11 be Z4 or is it Z3? Yeah, it would be, and I should have I should have written that. Thank you. 
Z4. Yeah, that's Z3, this is Z4. Oh, I should know that that doesn't work with a tablet. It might work with a pencil, doesn't work with a tablet. So there are the four zeros. Very good. Now, here we have more zeros. We're being asked to come up with a polynomial of degree four, but there are only three zeros here. Well, let's look at each one. Let's write them out first. Z1 is negative five. Z2 is the square root of three. And Z3 is 11 fifths. Negative five is real and rational. No problem there. Ele <clears throat> 11 fifths is a fraction, but that just means it's definitely real and rational. Okay, now this specifies that the coefficients have to be real rational coefficients. That is normal kinds of numbers. Well, we'll get a normal kind of number from there, <clears throat> and we'll get a normal kind of number from there. If you let normal mean real rational. Okay, this little guy right here is real, but it's irrational. If it isn't paired up with its conjugate, it will cause a coefficient to be real and irrational, which is not what's being called for. So we have to find the conjugate of the square root of three, and the conjugate the conjugate of the square root of three is negative the square root of three. So Z4 would be negative the square root of three, which is the conjugate of that one. And it's real and irrational. Okay, so that's all you have to do with this homework set. If you see a complex number like three plus two I, then your other zero is going to be three minus two I. If you have, well, let's make them a lot alike. How about three plus the square root of two? Then you need its conjugate, three minus the square root of two.
OK, so that's one new thing we're talking about today. Now we're going to talk about something else. And this is minding your P's and Q's. Which is an old. Old kind of. Mind your P's and Q's. Um, it's an old kind of saying. Probably isn't used anymore, but my mother used to say it to me. You better mind your P's and Q's. And I knew she was getting irritated. And my mother liked to hit when she got irritated. So I started minding my P's and Q's. Well, that's not what we're talking about here. But one of the things we need to do when we're looking for rational zeros, rational zeros up here are numbers like this. They're the zeros that just automatically generate nice numbers uh, in front of the variables, the nice coefficients normal coefficients. Um, yeah, so one is a real rational zero, but not the I numbers. And one is, uh, and four is a real rational number, but not these numbers. They're um, conjugates and they're irrational. So, what this says is list all of the potential rational zeros. That doesn't mean that this f of x even has any rational zeros. But there's a rule that gives you what the potential ones are, all of the possible rational zeros. And here's how you do it. You label the constant at the end as P. And you label the coefficient, the leading coefficient as Q. Then you factor P into all of its integer factors and you factor Q into all of its integer factors. So nine can be factored into uh, plus and plus or minus one, plus or minus three, and plus or minus nine. Because all the possible factor pairs of nine would be one times nine, or negative one times negative nine. Two won't go into it evenly, three will though. 3 times 3, or negative 3 times negative 3. And then, and then, yeah, the 9. So, you have either positive, positive or negative 1, positive or negative 9, positive or negative 3. Now, 1 will only factor into plus or minus 1. Here's how you find all of the possible, all of the potential rational zeros. Which doesn't mean that they're all rational zeros. Or that there even are any, but if there are some, they will be among the numbers I'm going to show you. To find these numbers, we say P over Q. And that means plus or minus one, plus or minus three, plus or minus nine over plus or minus one. Well, really? That's not hard. So plus or minus one plus or minus three, plus or minus nine. Those are your possibilities. You have six 
possibilities for rational zeros in this problem. Five of them might be the rational uh, zeros. They're not asking you to find the zeros, they're asking you to find the potential zeros. The group of numbers you would have to look at to see what are the zeros and what are not the zeros. And we'll do that tomorrow. But meanwhile, let's go on and do it again. List all of the possible rational zeros of the function. Now this is going to be a little more involved. Here's our P and here's our Q. All the factors of P are going to be plus or minus one and plus or minus five. That's not hard. Ah, uh, but 18, Q. Let's just kind of work that out over here. 18 equals one times 18, um, two times nine, three times six. And then they start to repeat. They reverse and repeat. So, my factors of Q are going to be plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, plus or minus six, plus or minus nine, and plus or minus 18. So that all of our possible rational zeros are going to be P over Q. That is plus or minus one or plus or minus five all over plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, plus or minus six, plus or minus nine, and plus or minus 18. Now, I can really get a tired hand from writing all of these pluses and minuses. So watch how I handle this so it doesn't really take that long. I am going to take one and put it over each of these numbers on the bottom. So one over one, one over two, one over three, one over six, one over nine, and one over 18. And then I'm going to take five and put five over each of these numbers. 5 over 1, 5 over 2, 5 over 3, 5 over 6, is that right? Yeah. 5 over 9, and 5 over 18. Now, I sneak back in Except, of course, I get rid of the one over one and I just say one. And I get rid of the five over one and I just say five. Okay, now I'm gonna put a plus or minus in front of each of them. And all of these questions are multiple choice. So you have to look at the list they present you with very carefully. 
Now, how many are these? One, two, or I should say two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. I have 24 possible numbers to check and see if they're rational zeros of the function. Why do we care about rational zeros? Because you, you don't have to approximate rational zeros. You have the exact answer right there in front of you. This is totally new. I mean, totally new to you, probably. If you haven't had college algebra or algebra two before. We don't teach it in Algebra 2, but if you had it in high school, they might have. This is one of the little joys that comes with college algebra everywhere. Is that it? Is that it? Oh my goodness. Well, let's go back here and talk about, because there are fewer, there are fewer numbers there. Let's talk about how you might find out if any of these numbers, there are six there, the positive numbers and the negative numbers, how you would find out if any <clears throat> Any of these numbers are zero, are zeros. Zeros of this f of x. Well, here's what you could do. Take turns substituting each of these numbers in for X. So you can do the positive numbers first. Oh, fifth, that's the fifth power. Fifth power. Squared and then plus nine. So what would that be? That would be one minus three times one, that's one minus three plus nine, that's negative two plus nine, that'll be seven, which is not zero. A zero of a function is a number you put in for the X and you get zero. So that didn't work. So now we know that positive one is not a zero. And you can do this with all of them. It's kind of boring. There's another method we're going to go into in more depth tomorrow. And that is synthetic division. And we might as well start going over it today. In many ways, in a lot of ways, synthetic division is easier than plugging numbers into a polynomial. Here's how you do it. You take f of x, Okay, now, it's a fifth degree polynomial, which means you have to make room for I'm 
running out of room. Plus the constant. Okay, you need to have space for all of these. Well, you do have an X to the fifth term. You do have an X squared term. And you do have a constant at the end but you don't have a fourth term, a fourth degree term, so I put a zero in front of it as a placeholder. You don't have a third degree term, so I put a zero in front of it. You don't have a one degree term, so I put a zero in front of it. And then, I write down the coefficients, the numbers in front of the variables, and the constant at the end. So I'm going to write this down, one, zero, zero, negative three, zero, nine. And I'm gonna make this funny looking little backwards L, or the lower half of a box maybe, I just know that it's what's used. All right, now, I found out that one was not a zero. The main purpose that we use this for is to find the zeros of functions. And I'll show you what this means. Um, let's see, another number. How about positive three? I put that here because this is the number I'm checking to find out if it's a zero of f of x. Then I come down here and I draw a line. That's the next thing I do. Then I take this number, the leading number, the leading coefficient, and I bring it straight down and I write it right there. That's a one. Now this is what I do. I take one and I multiply it by three. That's three. I write three here. And then I add zero plus three is three. Now I take the three I just wrote down here and I multiply it by the number up here. Three times three is nine. I write the nine here. Now you can get really fast at this because all you're doing is multiplying and adding, multiplying and adding, multiplying and adding. 0 plus 9 is 9. 9 times 3 is 27. Negative 3 plus 27 is 24. 24 times 3. 3 times 4 is, tw is 12. 12, carry the 1, that's going to be 72. 0 plus 72 is 72. Now, I have to take 72 and multiply it by 3. That's going to be, well, I need more room here, so 6, um, um, 21, 216. Um, and let me erase the 9 there and rewrite it over here. And that gives me 15, 1 plus 1 is 2, bring down the 2, 225. Okay, looking at this, I know that 3 is not a 0. How do I know? Well, I should say a 0 of f of x. 
which is this. Because if it were that number would be zero. I would have a zero there if three, if three were zero of f of x equals x to the fifth minus three x squared plus nine. And then you keep going on and on and on with the other numbers. Let's try negative nine. I haven't looked at, at, well, of course, they're not asking you this. I'm just showing you an example. How about negative nine? And I'll have one, zero, zero, negative three, zero, nine. Bring down the one. One. One times negative nine is negative nine. Zero plus negative nine is negative nine. Negative nine times negative nine is eighty one. Zero plus eighty one is eighty one. Ew. Eighty one times negative nine is negative 729 because the 9 is negative. Okay. Now negative 3 plus negative 729, you can tell this is not going to work probably, um, 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 is going to be 732 negative. See, if that were positive, 3 plus 729, that would be 12. Yeah, okay. So I add two negative numbers. I actually get a negative number. I'm not multiplying them. Now I'm multiplying them. Um, this is kind of ridiculous, isn't it? Negative 732 times negative 9 is 1827 plus 1 is 28. 7 times 9 is 63, plus 2 is 65. 6588, eight, eight, positive because negative times negative is positive. I add that to 0, I get 6588. Eight, eight, and whatever number I get here, it's going to be a 0 down here. So I know that negative 9 is not a zero of f of x. And so you keep going. There's no guarantee that any of those numbers would be a zero of f of x. Okay. 